so this debate, the topic is um, the four freedoms and the open source definition are outdated and no longer relevant in 2020. Um, our debaters are uh, Amanda Brock, Neil McGovern, Matt Jarvis, uh, Louis Villa, and I don't think I, oh, uh, I'm sorry, Andrew Katz, did I mention Andrew Katz? Um, and I'm gonna give it over to Amanda to get things started. So can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, okay. So I am not debating currently. I'm just going to say a few words to you because I caused this debate to be uh, suggested at Falsadem when the debate format came out. And I, I, I requested this slot because we had had a meeting last year under Chatham House rules as lawyers and there were some really vicious arguments going on. And obviously I can't attribute them to anybody because it was Chatham House rules, but it seemed like we'd reached a point where this discussion needed to be had more broadly. And this group of people were willing to come and talk about it. I will say that I asked a lot more people to come and talk and most people didn't want to debate. Um, I don't know if this is common across the debates, but particularly women didn't want to debate. So we have five of us. We did have six earlier in the week. We've had one drop out. So what we're going to do is slightly different, I guess. We are going to run through the panel order of 77333, but we are going to just flow a little bit more, be somewhere between a traditional sort of high school debate format and uh, a panel session. And we really want to get the audience debating with us, which was really why we put this in in the first place to discuss what's going on. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Lewis, who's the, the first proposer. So um, my disclaimer here, I mean, there is the standard disclaimer. Um, I want to particularly stress that I, until recently, was a card-carrying FSF member and, a, and am a member of the Open Source Initiative, was a member of the Open Source Initiative Board. So please use that in context when I say some things that are going to come across pretty harsh. So, um, <laughs> huh? Seven. Seven. Twenty? I can go. Um, someone was impressed that I had all these notes, and I said that I can talk about this for hours uh, without notes, but if I only have seven minutes, then I really need notes. So um, the first thing to know about whether or not the four freedoms and, and open source definition are still relevant today in 2020 is that these documents are 20 years old. If these documents still made sense 20 years after they were written, in exactly the same way that they were written without having a line changed of them, they would be some of the most prescient documents in human history. So it is, I think, not a criticism of their authors to say that they didn't fully understand where the industry was going to be, right? They didn't know that SAS would take, they didn't even know what SAS was. They didn't know that SAS was going to take over. They didn't know about the growth of data, privacy, and ethical concerns, though in the case of the Four Freedoms, some of those were the outlines of some of those were beginning to come into view, but the centrality of technology to all those questions uh, would have been difficult to see. Of course, the centrality of open source and free software to the entire industry, uh, that was a pipe dream that we all wanted. And we wrote these definitions in part with this sort of like, well, we will fight to get there instead of, instead of with the reality of, hey, we've won. Open source software is one. Free software, pointedly, I will point out, has not won. Um, and, uh, and of course, we've gone from fitting everyone in open source onto the campus of one university to literally there are more people doing open source now than live in all of Brussels or probably all of Belgium. I should have checked the population of Belgium before I started this. Um, so uh, the next thing I want to say about why these definitions are outdated is where do you see communities anywhere in these definitions. Every time people talk about free software and open source in the healthiest positive sense, they talk about collaboration of communities of connected people. The reason we are all here at FOSDEM is because of the amazing, wonderful community that is formed around this. And yet, if you look in these things, they are all about these dry technical things about copyright law. They speak nothing to what has actually been most powerful, which is the communities that have formed around them. Um, you know, one important way to think about GPL v2, which predates the OSD and the Four Freedoms, is that by enforcing a certain level of sharing, it makes a compromise on freedom in order to help build community. We, don't ha we have lost that language. We don't know how to compromise on data. Uh, well, actually, I was going to say on source code, but 
also in data, right? Van Lindberg, who's here, has been trying to get a license through the open uh, through the open source initiative process. Where guess what? Software in 2020 without data is junk. It's useless. And yet the open source definition says nothing about data. It says nothing about how we use this stuff. And so when we have to fight through these outdated definitions, oh man, I'm making great time. Oh, uh, this I don't know. It's a, a benefit, a curse. Um, you know, the uh, another thing. Is, so I was actually let me transition then into the data thing. It is perfectly compliant with the four freedoms and the open source definition to distribute software that won't build, install, or run. And it's limited to the software that you have in your hands, right? So if I got the software from you, then, hey, maybe we can put some requirements into place that, uh, require, uh, that I'm required to have it. But if it's on a server, the four freedoms sort of speaks to that. The open source definition does not speak to that at all. And uh, so in the world of 2020, when so much of our software isn't actually ever in our hands, the four freedoms in open source definition don't answer that question. And it's central to how we think about things, right? And again, uh, some of these licenses, uh, like AGPL, like the crypto cryptographic autonomy license, um, which I'm always going to want to call the cryptonomy license, um, those things aren't spoken to by the four freedoms in the OSD. And of course, there's this question that uh, I sort of alluded to earlier, is this question of what we use software for. In other words, what is the ethics of the software we use? Now, the four freedoms conceptually are grounded in ethics, right? We believe in the four freedoms because we believe that that leads to a more ethical software. But the four freedoms aren't tests of ethics. The four freedoms are tests of, well, can I, can I change this software? Do I have the right? Doesn't say anything about the ability to change software. Doesn't say anything about, uh, you know, are we, everyone in this room is in the 1% of people in the world, probably the 0.1% of people in the world in the level of control that we have over our software, right? Um, are the four freedom says nothing about that other 99.9%. Now, the FSF, to their, to their great credit, does say other things about that, but it's not captured in the four freedoms. If the FSF, the organization, went away tomorrow and we had to rebuild from the four freedoms, it would tell us very little about all this other important stuff, things like accessibility, things like privacy. Look in the four freedoms and you won't find those things. Um, and of course, that was obvious enough. That was already a problem in 2006. When I started law school, a classmate of mine who now works for the American Civil Liberties Union asked me, why is software morally important? Now, uh, those of you who've gone to law school know that most people in law school are drunk most of the time. Um, and so that's part of why I couldn't answer her question. Um, but my answer was big and sprawling, and they were not convinced. Right? To talk to her now and to say why is software morally important is, of course, an obvious question. Right? We all know from Facebook upsetting our elections, we know from the privacy implications of all this stuff, uh, that you know, software, at the end of the day, mediates essentially every human transaction. And so who controls software and who can use it has immense imp impact on issues of justice. And again, the open source definition says nothing of justice. It says nothing of morality. And the Four Freedoms only tangentially does. Um, to put it another way, when this was about Richard struggling with his printer, saying no restrictions on my use was good enough. When this is about Exxon using free software to extract carbon from the ground more efficiently, or the Department of Defense using Linux-based cloud systems to bomb the whole world more efficiently, don't we need to have some sense of ethics in those definitions, right? Um, in a world that is entirely driven by software, we need to be thinking about the bigger picture because access and modification is simply not enough. Uh, to quote Bradley, I yield the remainder of my time. Uh, you just swap over that if you have to go there, sure. on, your, uh, on your thing. Let's just uh, put that on there. Yeah. Okay. So, um, obviously, we don't agree with, uh, with Lewis's um, stand in the middle. Stand in the middle. I've got my notes here. <laughs>
Um, so, I think if we look back to the 1990s when these ideas were codified, you know, it's important, I think, to and useful to, to step back and, and revisit some of the why these things came into being. So, if we look back to the 1990s, um, mobile phones were pretty uncommon. Uh, mass adoption of the internet was pretty nascent. Um, many people didn't have home computers. Uh, the World Wide Web was just getting going. And um, as we fast forward 30 years, as Lewis said, software has become completely pervasive in our lives. So the control over the software that you use has become um, exponentially more important than it was uh, then. Um, for the vast majority of people in the first world at least, um, computing permeates everything we do at work and in our leisure time. And really, uh, open source and free software has enabled all of this. Um, Linux and the surrounding utilities from, from GNU and elsewhere now runs our planet. Um, everything from the tiniest embedded uh, device to the biggest supercomputers. Android powers most of the world's mobile devices. Uh, Tor enables persecuted minorities and whistleblowers to communicate securely. Uh, Bind, NTPD and all the other low-level networking components power the internet. OpenStack and Kubernetes uh, enable technology disruptions in every industry from telcos to banking. OpenSSL protects our uh, online world. OpenSSH allows us to use computers securely. Uh, the list goes on and on. And, you know, without free and open source software, we would likely have had none of the global cloud providers. Um, Google, Amazon, Azure, and every other player in that space run almost entirely on open source software. And without the four freedoms in the open source definition, our world uh, could have been very different. For those of us um, who were around during that time, it was not at all obvious that uh, Linux would take us to where we are today. Uh, there were definitely points in the 90s and the early 2000s when the open source and free software movements could easily have lost uh, those battles. Um, you know, this was the era of the CEO of Microsoft saying Linux is a cancer. Um, the days of encryption and computing power uh, considered to be offensive weapons that needed controlling. And uh, the days of things like the SCO lawsuit against uh, IBM claiming ownership over Linux. So there were definitely armies raged, uh, ranged against us. And ultimately, the power of community, um, which the Four Freedoms and the OSD have given us, proved to be the best way of producing high-quality software. And that's ultimately proved to be the tipping point. Uh, so whilst um, those things are both specific about source code, I, I think that source code, in a way, isn't necessarily the most important aspect of that. It's what goes along with that access to source code that's really had that power to change the world. Um, creating community around software, uh, communities in terms of developers and communities in terms of users, is what has enabled the creation of world-changing software projects uh, like Linux, like Kubernetes, like OpenStack. Without community, none of those projects would have, able, would have been able to achieve the success uh, that they have had, and our world would, would likely be a very different place. Um, you know, as an example of that, in the, in the 2000s, Microsoft were uh, giving uh, customers access to source code. But that doesn't actually provide to users the things that are implied in the four freedoms in the OSD. That doesn't give them that ability to change and integrate, or the ability to influence the development of that software. That can only happen with open design, open development processes, all of which ultimately come back to community. And I, I think that, uh, that the ideas behind the Four Freedoms and, and the OSD have also permeated across our culture in lots of different ways. They're powerful concepts that have a life of their own. Uh, we can look at publishing, you know, around the Creative Commons. Uh, we can look at uh, examples in the legal field, uh, things like Grop Law. Um, and um, we can look at the open hardware movement, uh, where we're now applying the ideas of open collaboration and sharing to hardware design and development. And so these ideas of openness have really taken root in our culture. You know, many very large companies now have adopted those open source principles internally and externally um, as the best way of developing complex software. Uh, so in an era where our entire lives are focused around platforms, who, where we store our photos, our personal data, our emails, our interactions with our friends and loved ones, um, openness becomes increasingly important. 
non-open platforms do put us at risk of arbitrary changes in terms and conditions, uh, often also removing our ability to question those decisions. Our videos might get removed from YouTube, our Facebook posts get taken down, our Twitter accounts frozen, and it's often impossible to appeal against those kinds of decisions. Uh, we may have access to remove because of where we live, uh, because of our religious beliefs, or because of arbitrary political changes that we have no control over. And we've also still got a healthy ecosystem of corporate patent trolls um, attacking free software on a regular basis. So I'd argue that the four freedoms and the open source definition have become more important in, uh, as, as concepts in the time since they were first defined. Uh, whilst it is true that in a world uh, dominated by on-demand computing and software as a service, it may have become harder to appreciate their relevance, but the ideas and concepts that they embody have never been more important. I see the 58 seconds. <laughs> Right, looks like I have seven minutes. I've prepared for three, so I will speak very, very slowly. Um, also, somewhat um, confusingly, um, I um, am also going to be um, speaking in support of the four freedoms because of the fact that there's a change in running order because one of the speakers dropped out. Um, if, the, um, if the open source definition and the four freedoms are outdated, then why have they been used more recently by organizations such as the Open Source Hardware Association, or the Open Hardware and Design Alliance, or the Open uh, Knowledge Foundation, in each case as the, benef uh, as the basis for their own set of equivalent freedoms and principles in those particular fields of endeavor. So open hardware, open source hardware, open data have all adopted principles that are very closely based on either the four freedoms or the open source definition. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is that those principles still hold and they still work. And uh, my experience, um, it, my, I've been involved in drafting the CERN Open Hardware License. And as part of that experience, I found that reference back to both the four freedoms and the open source definition proved to be very useful on um, numerous occasions, particularly because during the drafting process, people continued to say to us, wouldn't it be great if the CERN Open Hardware License could do this? Wouldn't it be great if it could do that? They wanted it to, for example, ensure that any hardware that was made and licensed under the CERN Open Hardware License was um, sustainably produced. You know, great idea. That, that's, that, that, that's a very laudable aim, certainly. Um, they also wanted to make sure um, that any hardware that was produced was fixable as well. So that would be you know, easily accessible. Things like, you know, don't use security fastenings. Um, don't, don't glue things um, unless you absolutely have to. Make sure that you can take things to pieces. You can um, substitute components most easily. You know, again, that's a great idea. Um, and more generally, various suggestions trying to prevent the hardware that was licensed under the CERN Open Hardware License uh, from, from being used for evil, whatever that evil happened to be, whether it was um, evil that was uh, you know, used um, as a weapon or um, in... Um, um, some, some sort of um, uh, uh, non-environmental fashion. Um, so we, we kept on getting inundated you know, with all of these very, very laudable ideas. And uh, we felt very strongly that we needed to reject those because we would have ended up with a license that was effectively useless. It would, have had so, it would be so cumbersome to use, it would restrict the, uh, the use of the hardware so much we were trying to anticipate a whole bunch of things that really it wasn't appropriate to put in what, in essence, is an intellectual property rights license. And the easiest way to counter that was to go back to the original definitions. Now, there's absolutely no reason at all why you shouldn't campaign for these other things as well. 
in fact, there's, you know, you, yes, go out there and argue for, um, for environmental sustainability. Go out there and argue that hardware should be um, capable of, of um, being easily uh, repaired and so on. Um, but those are separate issues. And if you want to look at things in the software context like um, um, you know, sustainable community development and this sort of thing, then that's surely a place for a separate set of principles that go alongside the fundamental principles about software freedom and the open source definition. Sorry. Lost my notes there for a second. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. No, no. That, that that's fine. So, um, yes. As I say, I, I, I only prepared for three minutes anyway. Uh, so, my fundamental point is the um, open source uh, definition and the four freedoms. Uh, they remain um, uh, relevant and fundamental bedrock of what we're doing. There are plenty of other things that are also good, beneficial, and we should consider com campaigning for those separately. But don't try to conflate them all into a single set of principles. Thank you. I'm speaking for seven minutes, apparently. Excellent. Um, I, I've prepared three minutes worth of stuff as well, and I thought... No, it's fine. I, I can fill that. I'll, I'll fill it. It's OK. Um, and I thought I was going to be opposing it, but you just proposed this as well, so... I'll just kind of talk for seven minutes, um, prob probably on, on both. Um, I, I, I can start off speaking against. I don't know. Okay. Um, so I recently came back from the China Open Source Convention, and Tencent there had done a study and tried to estimate how much of the world's computing was now, of, of software running today, was open source. And they estimated over 95% of all software running is open source. We've won. It's brilliant. We've reached this utopia where we, everyone is in control. And why does it not feel like this? <laughs> There's something slightly odd here. For me, I'm going to say something slightly controversial, which is I don't care about free software. What? <laughs> I care about user freedoms. The intention behind making free software is important, but it's irrelevant if the reality is that users can't make use of those freedoms. Lewis was quite near. It's less than half a percent of the world's population can code. The chance of users being able to modify their own hardware or being rich enough to be able to afford to find someone and contract someone else to modify that, that software is vanishingly small. And it's our responsibility, I feel, to provide for that user first. Does it matter if a piece of code is GPL or BSD licensed, if your data is being sent to a third party to modify and monetize? Does it matter if something happens to be under an MIT license, if you can't access your computing because you have a disability, or you can't afford a really fast internet connection to get all the latest, um, all the latest software or the metadata that comes with it. That said, the question is that the four freedoms and the OSI is outdated and no longer relevant. <laughs> it is not what kind of world are we trying to make. I put to you that we can't build that world without those four freedoms. Yes, it is. Lewis is absolutely right. I completely agree with him. Openness is important. 
Community is important. Control of data is absolutely fundamental. I absolutely agree with him. But we can't get that without those four freedoms. They are the foundations on which we build this world we want to live in. To say, just get rid of them because it's not doing enough doesn't mean that, they, that you should get rid of them in the first place. And my question, I guess, to those who say they are outdated and no longer relevant, is simple. Which would you remove? Thank you. Okay, does that work? So I, I've sort of drawn the short straw here. Um, I have to sum up both both sides. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. I know, I know. But I've drawn the short. I'm going to explain why. It's yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Nobody's making me do anything. Um, I'm here of my own volition. Um, I have the short straw because we are five, not six, so we're not even. So I sort of have a double sum up to do based on both sides. So I'm sort of going to try, if it's possible, to make the case for both sides. And obviously, I've just written my notes now to do a sum up. So if we think about what the guys have said, it's very clear and ran throughout everybody's talk that we're sitting in a stage of confusion, right? Everybody has said that there's a lack of clarity, a lack of transparency, and a confusion across the half a percent that we agree on in the end that's in this room and beyond. So how do we get to a stage of confusion? I think that if we look back on the history of both the Four Freedoms and the OSD, we see people choosing to work and to put, give their personal time in those environments because they believed and because they wanted to do something. So they made that decision to go and become developers working in those areas as opposed to proprietary. And that was a really clear decision for each and every one of them to make when they made it. Now life has moved on and we've heard people talk about being a victim of our own success in some ways. And as it's moved on, I think there might have been a bit of a disconnect. So a lot of people in this room, because a lot of you are much, much younger than me, have grown up with open and free being part of your day-to-day -day existence. And that's a good thing, and that's a commendable thing. But you haven't had to go through that same choice process. And that same choice process, you would hope, would have been given to you and let you make an informed decision about what and why you do it. But if it's just the norm, you accept the norm and you don't challenge it. And I'm told, I'm the age I am, so I haven't grown up 20 years later, but I'm told that it hasn't been clear to people. So I remember having an argument a year ago with a developer I really respect who kept telling me public source and open source were the same thing. And they're not, because you don't have a license with public source. And if you don't have a license, it's not open source, right? It's very clear. So I think we have what the boys have talked about as a confusion for no bad reason. And we need to think about what that confusion is, where it's come from, why it's there. And to help us understand not just the decisions the developers made to become open and free developers, we also have to understand what was meant by open and free. So we've got the OSD, we've got the four freedoms, but those were developed at a time when we didn't have social media. So we don't see years and years of Twitter feeds. We don't see archives of many of the conversations around some of those. I mean, put your hand up if you believe that the OSI developed the OSD. Where did the OSD that's, that's come the from? <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just going to see. I'm not sure that I trust the, the hands up thing here. So where did the OSD come from? Right, good. So did Bruce go up to a mountain and heave this bit of stone back down with 10 things to find there that could not be changed? No, he didn't. He didn't at all. What he did was come up with something that in the context and in the time seemed to be reasonable. It's worked for 20 years, so it's certainly reasonable. We've seen the success that the boys have talked about in open source. Maybe we are a victim of our own success, but it has been successful. So we've got to give it credit. We've got to respect it. And we should try and understand where it came from and why it's the way it is. So every one of those words there would have been thought through. Every one of those words there has allowed us to get to a stage in history where we can say we've won, right? Where we can have this massive conference where Lewis can stand up and with hard facts to back him, tell us that the whole of the, the, the Belgian country would not add up to the number of open source developers we have in the world. So we have won, but 
why do we trust something just so absolutely? Now, I like to challenge things, as some of you who know me know. And I've wondered long and hard about that. Why do we just trust it? Well, you have to have something to base it on. Right, so the, the OSI didn't get a trademark. Does that really matter? Do we care? We know what open source is because we have a definition. But I think that anything that we follow, if we look at laws, if we look at maybe Americans, you find this different with the Constitution that's written. But generally, for most of us, we're looking at something there that changes and evolves over time, right? We change, we mature, we grow up. Our technology has changed over the last 50 years, over the last 10 years. It's not just the internet, it's the fact you have connectivity everywhere. It's not just that you can access things online, it's the fact that you walk around with a phone in your hand the whole time. So our world is unrecognizable from the time that this was, uh, this was written. It has to be logical and sensible for us to challenge it, right? There'd be something wrong with this group, this group of highly intelligent people, if you weren't constantly pushing back and challenging. But I think that for us to make that challenge appropriately, we have to go back and understand what happened, why, what every word means, why every word is there, what are the things that maybe we don't know about that we need to understand in a context. How do the changes affect those words? How do the changes allow us to develop into something perhaps more of 2020? Oh no. Oh no, because I've got so much more to tell you. Right, so I have to speed up. So we should be able to challenge. We should be able to look at this. We need to think more about what changes mean and how that's going to impact us. Can I grab the mic and cross-examine some of you? Me. You can. <laughs> stand in the... Uh, Ask me what else and everybody answers. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I, I want to cross-examine Neil and Andrew, if I may. But we can... Um, yes. Can I have three for each of them? Sure, sounds good. I guess I'm the other way, huh? Um, so, uh, Andrew, you said that um, you you said that. Uh, oh yeah, negative time, sweets. <laughs> I'm going to go into the future. Um, you know, Andrew, you said that these issues of well, you know, you mentioned, for example, environmental issues that people wanted to bake into the open hardware, mm -hmm. uh, and you said that these are. Uh, separate issues, but if my labor as somebody contributing to an open project is being used to literally bake the planet, how is this, in a, how, this seems to me that it's inextricably the same. Can you explain what you mean by saying that they're separate? Um, I think the thought process is that you need to go through uh, to reach um, a set of criteria that um, are essentially about um, freedom to use something um, and um, freedom to copy it and freedom to study how it works and so on and so, so forth. Um, are fundamentally different um, from the set of criteria that you need to apply when you're looking at, at wider social issues. And as I say, I have absolutely no problem at all. In fact, I think it's, you know, it's highly laudable to come up with a set of principles that deal with these other issues. But I cannot see how it's possible to try to get essentially you know, one document to do the heavy lifting for all of these things in, in one go. But shouldn't I have some ability to discriminate and say I would prefer the planet not be baked? Uh, with the work that I have done? Um, of course. And uh, so you have a separate set of um, criteria. So you can, deter you can say that, um, uh, you know, my, that the, uh, the, these particular um, hardware, whatever it is, complies with, um, not only does it comply uh, with a um, set of open source hardware criteria, um, it also complies with a set of criteria that I want to apply to it that uh, deal with environmental issues. So if somebody uh, then takes that, then they would have to comply with both of those sets of criteria if they want to continue to describe it as being open source hardware and environmentally sustainable hardware. But if they don't care because they're Exxon, they're free to use it anyway. 
Well, that's dependent on the person who um, initially establishes the, the, the hardware design. It's up to their, their choice what restrictions that they're, they're, they're going they're well, to put on the, that. There, the, may be, there may be mutual incompatibilities there. Um, that's true. That's something that we have to, to work through. But I think um, I, I, this is a, a debate that we had quite extensively when we were talking about the CERN open hardware license. Um, and we felt that we just weren't um, equipped to be able to think about these, um, these sort of specific issues um, uh, uh, outside the scope of the, uh, the, essentially the sort of licensed intellectual property freedoms that we were trying to grant to people to enable them to use the particular designs. Right. Um, I have one other question that I want to ask you, but I'm going to switch to Neil uh, because we're halfway through. Um, so you asked, what would I remove from the open source definition? And, and I would prefer to think of that as, what would you add? Uh, because so, for example, you mentioned accessibility, and I know that's something that you and GNOME care deeply about um, and have. A, um, there's nothing in the f four freedoms or open source definition about accessibility. And um, iOS, by every uh, serious use by uh, people with accessibility concerns, uh, believe that iOS, which is definitely not free, is substantially more accessible than MAMO, uh, to name the last fully open source uh, mobile operating system I used, or early Android, which was more open source than current Android. Should we be adding to the four freedoms or open source definition to be to take into consideration, for example, accessibility? Um, I think it's incredibly important, and I'm sure you agree that accessibility is, is considered, and there is many things I think we all agree that we need to improve and we need to add. Um, I don't think the four freedoms in the open source definition is the place to do that. Um, I should also point out this big <laughs> thing here. When I say I believe this, this I may or may not believe this. Um, <laughs> however, as, as an example of this, I, I'm not a lawyer, so being cross-examined by a lawyer is a little bit worrying. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, I was on the city council in Cambridge, and a motion was passed that we shall only use free-range eggs everywhere. It's brilliant, fantastic, and we can no longer give uh, flu vaccines to the staff because that uses egg protein, and there was no way to guarantee it. Do so, we want to mess about with, with, with ensuring, with messing these two things up? I think there's unforeseen circumstances. So if the city council had insisted that everything, uh, that all software used by the city council was free software, uh, and that meant that accessible st staff couldn't use it, would that be okay? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> great, great answer. Okay, so, uh, so who wants to cross? Is that Amanda or Neil? Amanda? Who wants to cross Lewis, and does anyone want to join Lewis, I guess? Is a... For the record, I'm not the kind of lawyer who does cross-examinations, so this is like so, awesome. Which... This is a, a new thing to us, because we don't normally do this in debate. Ah, okay. That's why we're confused. Yeah. Okay, and so uh, when we get to, uh, to, th to like 20 seconds before the end of the time, so you hear some of us like snapping or rubbing our fingers. If everybody joins us, it's a lovely soft way to let people know that their deadline's coming, and then we all applaud at the end, and then they know they have to be done. I'll join you on this side if you want. Oh, yeah, sure. Neil's going to redeem himself. So I, I've never cross-examined anyone in my life. I'm not that kind of lawyer. I was a commercial lawyer, not a litigator. So uh, I don't quite know how to do this. Um, Lewis, you, you talk about the sort of ethical stuff and putting requirements in there. And apart from the fact that it doesn't work within the current definitions, how would you ever make that work in real life? So how, how do you enforce that? And sort of how do you make those decisions? <laughs> Well, they're hard. Um, I think the interesting question, I think the interesting answer to that uh, is to say that if you'd asked the same questions about copyleft uh, before the GPL was written, or indeed even after GPL v1, the answer would have been, I don't know, right? I know, but you're making the case for it, so you have to know. <laughs> 
No, I don't. Uh, what I have to know is that if we experiment, as we did in early open source licensing, I have faith that most of those experiments will fail terribly, um, but that at least some of them may hit on workable answers. Uh, and so the current open source definition, as it stands, rejects all experiments out of hand. Says uh, if you uh, you know if you experiment with ethical licensing in any way, uh, the uh, the OSI will wag its finger very very vigorously at you, and uh, tell you that what you're doing is a bad thing, right? And I actually agree with the OSI that 99% of this is terrible ideas, right? But I don't want to be the one to say to that 1%, you know, I, I try to put myself in the shoes of the people who criticized Stallman early on, right? Who said, copy left will never work, this is unenforceable, this is communist. Um, and if we had let those people determine the playing field, then none of this would have happened, right? Instead, we allowed some experimentation in licensing and you know, most of the early open source licenses are not used. Most of them were failures, but yet some of them did, right? Some of them did succeed. Okay, so give me an example of how you might see that work, how you think that could possibly work. Well, I mean, there's two different, uh, two different levels where this would work, right? One level is the open source initiative could say, uh, certain types of discrimination uh, are allowed. And in fact, I would say that the open source initiative has already said that certain types of discrimination are allowed against certain types of business models, like say, putting proprietary kernels in your phone, right? Like that is a business model that is explicitly disfavored by the OSI because they allow the GPL, right? Uh, similarly, they, uh, the OSI discriminates against certain SaaS business models by allowing the AGPL. Um, now, we pretend that that's not discrimination against certain business models, uh, except when it comes up to, oh, well, data is a business model, so we can't discriminate against proprietary data. Well, guess what? We already discriminate against proprietary stuff, so we do all the time. So one thing would be to simply acknowledge that, that discrimination is happening uh, and allow for a little bit more of it. On the how might it work on an ethical license side, come to CopyleftConf on Monday. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the trick, as uh, all the lawyers know, to writing something that actually works is often about how you manage ambiguity, right? So a lot of these early, there's a, a very well-intentioned uh, license called the Atmosphere license, I think, that essentially said that any entity that had more than $10,000 invested in uh, carbon extracting businesses, which is essentially every, industry, every business of any decent size, right, because of the nature of the stock market and how they invest their money, uh, couldn't, use, uh, couldn't use the software, right? And that, I would agree, is unworkable. Um, but you could imagine there's a list of the top 100 uh, carbon investing businesses themselves, right? And you could simply say, if you're on that list, you can't use this. Right. So Every you, other business can use it. So, you, but you say you believe in free and open source software, right? Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. I mean, for purposes of this, of this debate, maybe. I mean, for real life, for the record, uh, uh, come disclaimer. On, come on. <laughs> Lewis, Lewis, either you believe in it or you don't believe in it. Come on. I. I, I um, I am deeply concerned that open as we currently define it removes a lot of ethical constraints and doesn't solve actual ethical problems that we have, right? It doesn't, it doesn't make Android more accessible than iOS. We pretend it's better, but if you have any kind of visibility impairment, for example, it's not better. Um, you know, and similarly, if Exxon is using it to extract carbon from the ground. Okay, is there a danger that you might be being really, really naive? And that if you, sorry, Lewis, this is not no, personal. No, no, I may or may not believe this. Uh, of course, of course. <laughs> but isn't there a danger that if you make this one exception, potentially you open a floodgate for people who might be less well-intentioned than you are in terms of doing that? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> How wrong am I? Very wrong. How naive. How naive am I?
there anyone other, with all due respect, is there yeah. anyone other than the legal Devon regulars yeah. who has a question? If, if I don't know your name, it would be awesome to have a question. For really, you. and people who think that the motion is right will get preference. So anybody who wants to say the motion is right. The motion was again. That the, oh, it's gone. Uh, that the OSD and four freedoms are out of date. Remember for I'll video, please oh. always speak into the mic. Thank you, Lewis. Um, the motion was that the four freedoms and OSD are out of date and not fit for purpose in 2020. No, no longer relevant. No longer relevant in 2020. Do you want someone who believes And someone who believes in that to ask us a question? Yeah. Carla Piana. <laughs> no, 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 Carla. Uh, I, I'll, I'll ask a question uh, for what Lewis just said. Uh, so considering that the history of GPL includes uh, sanctions against so South Africa and, and sort of not, and, and not putting South Africa on a list in the license so that once they reformed then the there would be like <coughs> like a li license in legacy having an embargo against them anymore so if we put Exxon on a list uh, and Exxon reformed how would that work I mean I, I don't want to get into too much detail on this because I think it's a bit of a distraction from the bigger picture um, but uh, there are, for example, in this particular case, uh, there are third parties who publish new such lists every year, specifically with the idea that they could be that they could reform. Right? They might drop off that list, uh, and so therefore, you might not want universities to divest from them, for example. Right? And so, if you say, "Look, if you drop off the list, great." Uh, now, that requires partnering with a third party, which. Historically, I got to say, is not something our communities have been terribly good at, <laughs> um, and I say that with lots of love. Um, so, you know, it's not easy, right? I, I mean, I think you know something that uh, Bradley told me some time ago that I think is deeply right is that copyleft was really a, a, a big conceptual leap, and I want us to be open to the to the notion that there might be some big conceptual leaps, just because we've seen in the past six months some well-intentioned but badly drafted licenses does not mean that there will never be a well-drafted license. And the question is how we, how we react to that or frankly how we get left behind. And I think that's really important both in terms of the conversation about the OSD and on a more broad basis. We have to think about how do we deal with this, right? How are we going to look at changing it? If we are going to change anything, how could it possibly change and what's the impact of the past? What does change look like that is done in a measured, thoughtful way is a really great question to ask that moves us beyond this binary of the debate. Hi, and thank you for this debate. Um, I've been in industry for a very, very long time. I don't know what the four freedoms are. Can we define them? <laughs> Can I, can I respond to yeah, that? Okay. <laughs> so here's the thing. You are in great company. Um, this is something I didn't have time to fit into my talk, but I will take the opportunity to say it right now, which is that uh, one of the, I was speaking recently to a developer, a uh, lead developer of one of the uh, most widely used JavaScript frameworks in the world, which is to say one of the most widely used pieces of software in the entire world. And he said, I don't understand why you all are still discussing this. We just think that open source means we get to collaborate and we do it on, we probably do it on GitHub. And as long as I can still collaborate, these needles on the, you know, how many angels on the head of a pin uh, are, you know, not super relevant to him, right? Um, and, and I think that's a, as we grow from 100,000 developers to 100 million developers, you know, most of those people are not going to know what the, you were in. I, how many people here know what the four freedoms are? All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. How many of you would feel comfortable coming down here and reciting them? Because <laughs> I admit I wouldn't actually. Neil? Just before you pass it to Neil, I'm going to say maybe we need something that isn't open or free to be defined. Maybe there's a need for these other things that people are talking about that they're doing to be described somewhere. Yes, I can repeat them because they've just been placed in front of me. Um, it, is, it is basically, you, can, you get a program. I'm not going to read 
off this because it's a boring way of doing it. Um, you get a program, you can run it, you can use it for whatever you want. And, and that's actually the first one, I think, is, is what's being talked about here of, of part of the problem is for whatever you want. What if I make a program and I don't want you to do what you want to do? But that's kind of tied into the fundamental freedom there of you can do whatever you want with it. It's your software, you're in control of your own computing. Um, and I think if, and that is so fundamentally tied into th this concept of these, these four freedoms. I mean, the other ones is things like uh, you can modify it, you can give it to your friends, um, you can redistribute to the entire communities, various, and there's various tests which come along with that, like desert island tests, Chinese dissident tests, and things like that. But the fundamental, the first freedom, the zero freedom, is that you can run it for any purpose. Now, if the author is saying you can't, use it for evil, for example, then what is evil? evil. Yeah. And, then how do you enforce and then how do you enforce that? And, or if I say you can't, or we, or we have a magic list, what happens if I produce a load of free software and it's absolutely brilliant, and then I get on that list? All right, so thank you very much. Um, so audience, did you learn anything from this debate? Raise your hand. Excellent. And the other question is, did you change your mind on anything as a result of this debate? <laughs>